because I have two apologies to start with. The first is that I don't speak Spanish, so I apologize for that. And I'd like to apologize to Carlos, the translator, because I get more excited I'm going to speak faster and faster, and he's going to start waving at me and doing signals to slow down. So we'll see how we go. But I'm very, very excited to be here. Hopefully the presentation will come up. Um, as you probably heard, I, I work at Facebook, but my background is not one of technology. If you are hoping for um, somebody from America and someone with a technical background in social media or technology or coding, I'm a copywriter from New Zealand. So um, I approach everything I talk about less about platforms and technology and far more about um, people and sort of how we manage the creative process through all the things that are going on. Um, this first slide to me symbolizes what's going on with a lot of the people we're trying to reach and talk to and make things for. The pace of change when we look at the technology that's in all our lives is so fast and so great, and we as humans take it for granted, that I think it's best to think of them as superpowers. That we have in the last 36 months accelerated the adoption of superpowers. And we probably have more than this, but I think of three a lot. The first one I think of is infinite memory. We have infinite memory as, as a people now because we have access to everything ever made, which is really the other superpower, is that for all of human history, we've not had access to everything, and now we do. And we have unlimited ability to store it and retrieve it. That's extraordinary. The third superpower I think of a lot, and as I said, there's probably a lot more than three, is the ability to connect with the thing and people we care about all the time. We no longer go online, we live online for much of the world's population. And the growth of this is extraordinary. And we all live it and we all see it. And I think we see it so closely sometimes we don't even notice it. But it's pretty transformational. And it's all obviously the rapid acceleration if you look at the data is because of this. This is, a, someone sent me this the other day. This is a photo of, a, on the left hand side there's a newspaper ad, I think from about 1991. And it's for a, in America called Radio Shack. <coughs> All the technology on that page of this technology company from 1991 costs about $4,000. All of the technology in there can be got on the phone for about $99 now. So we've collapsed and lowered the price of the access to this extraordinary technology, and that's what's driving it. The issue we have is people who create stories, films, technology, ideas is that we now are talking to people, we're looking to reach people who have infinite supply and finite time. So we've gone from a world where experiences were somewhat rare and controlled and finite on linear tracks of television, or linear tracks of magazines and newspapers, it's finite, to an infinite supply. Not just of what is created now, but what has always been created. That is an extraordinary competitive set. So when we create things now, the startling truth of what we have to face is that everything we make competes with everything ever made. On some vector, the new documentary we're making is competing with people's attention with the greatest films. Because of ubiquitous access to these things, we have an unlimited choice. So to me, this is the question. The question is how do we decide what matters? How, for the people we're trying to reach and engage with, do we know that the films and the stories and the ideas and the utilities and the applications and the photography and all the things we care about in this room, how do we make sure they actually reach the people? I think the good news, which I'll talk about more later, is that the craft skills of beautiful language and craft and all the things we hold dear as a culture around the world and our business are more valuable than ever. But I think there are some shifts we have to take into consideration. The first one I'll talk about is I believe if you look at the world of advertising, if you look at our business, it's in the world of diverting attention. We are in the business of believing there's a flow of content and we have the right of permission to disrupt. And I think we need to change that deep philosophy to one of connection. When we have unlimited choice, the ability to disrupt one path doesn't work because there's an infinite number of places for me to go. So instead of disrupting or feeling like we have the permission to disrupt, we need to build ideas as people are going to connect around. The other thing when we design experiences, and I'll get into this a little bit later when we talk about some technologies, 
is I think as creative people, particularly over the last decade in digital, we've rewarded ourselves on engagement and time spent. We love to build complicated things. We love to have people go on a complex journey through our brand experience. And sometimes that still now can be very, very good, but we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it as lightweight as it can possibly be? Are we giving the maximum reward for the time people are spending with us? Or are we assuming we're so interesting, we're so engaging, people will just stay with us? And I think we have to put ourselves in other people's shoes. The other thing, and I had a wonderful dinner last night with some of the board of the organization, and we talked about this a lot, which is the other thing that's probably one of the most exciting parts of our business right now is going beyond narrative and going beyond even UI design and actually starting to build utilities, actually manifesting new products and new services for our clients that stand alone. So rather than even articulating a story about a problem, we're actually responsible for building the, building the solution. And sometimes when you look at the things that explode in the space that people connect around, it's really things that solve problems, that actually solve the issue or celebrate the potential of what a brand is trying to do. Possibly the biggest shift that I see in, in how we approach creativity in our business is we need to accept we're moving from a world of universal greatness to personal greatness. Each of you, me, everyone in the world is become empowered by technology and connectivity. We get to wrap ourselves in the things that matter to us, and we have the control of that. And each of us is unique in our makeup and in the people and things we care about. And this changes a lot of industries. It's already changing for the better an enormous number of industries. Let's look at television. Are you familiar with the show The Love Boat? Yeah. You are? They have that explain? Very good. So, well, not really. But, um, <laughs> if you think about the 80s and the 70s, television had to be pretty good for everyone. Right? It had to be pretty good for everyone. But because of the fragmentation of the television landscape, and Carl's mate said, I used to work in television. We now have a different universe where we have content created for fewer people far more deeply that then can scale out because it's built. And the greatness of it is determined by groups of individuals with deep passions for it, whether that's the highbrow Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones or Honey Boo Boo, which I do not know what you have to say, but it's one of the reality shows. Right? We have this profusion of diversity, and it's the same with film, sorry, music where we would have had a dire straits or a few very, very big bands and then unknown bands. We now, if you look at the work of radio and Spotify and the way in which we engage with music, there's multiple streams of much deeper connection. I think this is going to be increasingly true and celebrated for advertising, where we still look for one piece of work that stands as our lovers, which I'm sure we will continue to do. But I think we have to get better at celebrating individual streams of connecting the right messages to the right people for the right reason. I think it's because I get asked this question a lot. What's the best ad on Facebook? I might just title Chief Creative Officer of the Creative Shop. What is the best ad on Facebook? And I spent three years thinking about that as we've evolved and changed. This is the issue. So all those pixels from the time we had a billion monthly active people on the platform, this was hacked together by someone outside the company. Each of those dots within those dots represents a billion people on that screen. And if you think we have 750 million people on the platform every day, all over the world, the question is not what's the best ad, the question is whose Facebook are you talking about? What collection of people are we talking about? Because the platform is not as interesting as the people. I like to think of people very much like a dinner party, when I think of social behavior, or I think of the way we behave online, particularly on Facebook, where people have their identities and they're connecting with the people they care about. I think about like a warm environment like a dinner party. These are flesh and blood individuals that we're connecting with. These aren't pixels, this isn't data. These are real people that are bringing themselves to the table as, as communicators, as advertisers, as writers, as art directors. We need to think of them in that way. The beauty of this, the brilliance of this, is that our marketing targets that we've talked about for years in agencies being very understanding and having human insight about their lives and their needs and what they're looking for in the world and the solutions they want to build for them, the stories we want to transport, transport them with. These people we can now actually find. We can actually talk to them. We don't have to be 
deeply committed to them and in the hope of them, we can actually wrap and connect with people with real meaning and real value. And this doesn't mean just three million euro films or, or high art. This, as I said, can be tools and utilities. It can be promotional offers for someone who needs to make ends meet that week. It can be any part of what we consider marketing, connecting with the right people with huge relevance for the right reason. This, to me, is the future art we're looking at, where we're really connecting with people at eye level. So where can you find these people? Well, there are lots of places you can find them. And obviously, I have some bias in this conversation. But what we look at when we sit down and we build ideas with our clients and with agencies all around the world, we start with people and we start with the business problem and we ask who are the people who really matter to this idea? Who are the people? Not who are the numbers, not who are the demographies, but who are the people? Who do we want to connect with? And then the second part, and this is where the creativity, this is where the art comes in, is we're reaching them in a place where they want to discover what matters to them. They're looking at their newsfeed and they're saying, what is going on? And the in, incredible need to be relevant and to appreciate that space is a craft issue. It's not just a data issue or a technology issue or a, or a, or a code issue. It's really a craft issue built on the craft skills we've always had, but also the human insight that's always separated our business from anything else. So this is Newsfeed. I'll play you a little film that just shows you how we sort of look at storytelling in this form. So within Newsfeed, whether we're on a mobile phone, whether we're on an iPad, whether we're on desktop, people throughout the day check multiple devices, but they go to the same place, and I like to think of Newsfeed as a search query. People just want to know, and for many of you in the room use Facebook, I hope. And we're asking a question, we're asking, what's going on? What matters? What's trending? What's going on? What am I, what am I, what's happening with my friends and the things I care about? And that space, that space where we connect with brands, that's a special place. And I really think, as I talk about disruption to connection, and from heavyweight to lightweight, we need to think about it in a different way. And then for me, it starts with just putting ourselves on the receiving end, and thinking of the people we're connected with, and respecting our audience's time, just like we do our own. Just make things and put things into the world that would break thought and craft and care, and that's something that would put a smile, put a thought, put an idea, put some information. And as I say, give me a discount on something I care deeply about. But we need to approach advertising less about averting attention and more about adding value. And I think that's, a, that's not a good thing for Facebook. I think that's something that's going to drive change across our entire industry. In short, we need to stop marketing at people that we've been doing for about 100 years. We need to really focus on marketing for people. Marketing needs to start from people up to add value from everything we do. There's a lot of talk about data or data. I think, you know, I work at a company with a lot of data and a lot of data and a lot of science and it's amazing and we have incredible people. But this is one thing I know. I know all the data in the world is only any good if it inspires an amazing idea or enables an incredible action. Everybody asks for insight, but the insight comes from humanity looking at data and doing something with it that's extraordinary. That is a creative exercise. So embracing the potential of data to unlock creativity, to focus creativity, that is the real strength. That art and science is the real strength of 
where our business is going. There's not one replacing the other. We both have to have enormous respect for the talents and abilities of the other four. Scale really matters. One of the greatest frustrations I have in the business, and I've been in it a little while, is this separation of our business between the bulk of the work that sees people in the world and a small amount of work we judge in award shows all around the world that no one ever sees. And while I appreciate the craft and I judge Cam and I judge that, just come back from judging the Andy Awards, I would love it if we could bring those two worlds together by having creative people all around the world here as deeply for reaching the people with their work as they do about craft and work. Because as I say here, an idea that you love doesn't scale to the people that matter. To have a business impact, to drive forward your client's business, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It can matter in a craft sense, it can matter in, a, in an artful sense. But for an applied art like ours to build factories and change economies, we need to make sure our ideas are connected with people who will affect change. I think a place where we really fall into trouble, and I am guilty of this, is in meetings, in clients, and with agencies, when we get excited. We get excited. We've got an idea, and we're convinced everyone in Spain is going to download our app. We think that because we love it. We think that because we're excited. And we go what I call to the world of magical thinking. And in the world of magical thinking, we assume the people we're trying to reach will behave unlike we would as real people. So one of the greatest strengths or powers I think we can have in these rooms is that we always take ourselves into the room and ask ourselves a simple question. Would an ordinary person do this? Would a normal person do this flow? Would a normal person really use this every day? And if we're tough on the technologies we build and the ideas we build and the transmedia ideas we build, we'll scale them much more quickly. We'll design them to be much more lightweight and we'll make sure they connect with people that matter. In the process of connecting, you cannot overstate the transformational power of mobile. If mobile is still an afterthought in your thinking, whether that be creatively, whether that be through media, whether that be through connection planning, if it's something you think about as part of the body, you need to flip your organizational structure upside down and look very hard at the data of both the adoption and the engagement of mobile. In the UK last week, we released numbers that digital has now overtaken television for time and spent. Somewhat interesting. What's really interesting is that it's all mobile. That is not desktop. It's all the mobile adoption. Mobile is a terrible word because it doesn't mean people walking down the street. It means people in bed. It means people in front of the TV. It means people at home, on the couch. Mobile is part of our lives because it empowers us. Okay. Creativity. Let's talk about some work. Okay, so um, I joined Facebook about three years ago, as I said. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about, I'll play a little bit back, why we care about creativity so much. So I talked about the specialness of the place in people's newsfeed and the relationship people have with, with Facebook. We deeply believe, this comes from Zuck down for a long time, that the advertising, the way brands connect with people on Facebook should be additive to the experience. It should not be a tax on the experience. And to do that takes time, it takes craft, and it takes talent. So we've deeply invested in reaching out and building structures to celebrate, educate, and inspire the global creative community. We have a global creative council that meets for the last two years, every three or four months, and we have the Facebook Studio Awards, which is just about third round on. Really just to celebrate people who are doing interesting, innovative things on the platform, and then hopefully shining a light for where the business is going. In 2012, which was the first year we celebrated the campaign with Small Business Saturday. It was really about social connection. The last year we did Oreo, which went on to win the Grand Prix in Cannes, which really talked about publishing the cadence of creativity. I can't announce the winners yet, and these, these are just a couple of pieces that I like from the entries that we actually worked on that I just want to talk about for different reasons. But if I tell you one thing with the entries we got was what was incredible about Oreo last year about about the cadence of production and creativity for publishing. We, it was so exciting to see we had dozens and dozens and hundreds of different campaigns that were doing the same thing. So the adoption of the canvas as a publishing platform is a global phenomenon now, and I, I really credit 
the celebration of Orient, not just with us, but in Canada and around the world. This is, this is a meaningful way to connect with people. They did with an agency called VML, and with media there. And it's to launch a hamburger. I'm not, not sure if you have Wendy's in Spain. Do you have Wendy's in Spain? Yeah. They're like McDonald's or Burger King. And they had a big launch coming up. And the reason I bring it up is one of the misnomers of sort of Facebook, I think, for some people is it's a social thing. There's a business thing and there's a social thing. Well, I want to talk to you about this idea because this is about making, working with a company and partnering with a company to make sure this launch was very, very successful in business. This was an incredibly important launch for a burger they had called a pretzel burger. It's a big burger for young men, primarily. And they worked with us in one of our programs called Publishing Garage to listen to what was happening in the social space, on Facebook, on Twitter, on a whole bunch of different platforms. And VML and, and my team in LA worked with the client who came, came, they came up with this idea that's just wonderful, which is about responding in dialogue to what's going on in the social space through sight, sound, and motion films that ended up everywhere. And I'll play you the film and you can see how powerful it is when you tell people that you're listening. When Wendy's launched its new pretzel bacon cheeseburger, we noticed that customers were loving it on Facebook and Twitter. So we encouraged them to continue to tweet and post their love. And we literally sang their words right back to them as pretzel bacon cheeseburger love songs. about the new cheeseburger as the actual lyrics, misspellings, hashtags, and all. Every week for five weeks, new tweets and posts were collected in real time, new love songs were scored, and a new video was rushed for production, released, and amplified for reach using Facebook target blocks. We even had former boy band balladeer Nick Lachey lend his famous voice to our fifth and final video. In the end, Friends of Love Songs was the most talked about Wendy's campaign in the brand's 44 year history helping to make the pretzel bacon cheeseburger the brand's most successful product launch ever. Just starting out doing this, but if you think about that idea of a marketing target and a media target, 
it means all that investment we put into finding people who are passionate, in this case around certain musical genres, we can find them, we can make things for them, and then we can deliver them back to them, like a gift, rather than hope that we find them. And this is called, uh, this is an anthology program called Made in America. There's no more accounting beer brand than Budweiser, the king of beers. But with the growth of craft beers and a massive amount of choice out there, Bud has lost a great deal of its relevance, especially within the important millennial audience. So our job was to find a way back into the heart of these guys, these gals, and this guy. You tried to blur your sphincter brow? Probably not. They only grew this one. Actually, not that guy. To make it happen, Budweiser asked us to leverage and extend their Made in America Festival, a yearly concert featuring dozens of artists handpicked by Jay-Z. But well, let's be real, music content can be highly polarizing. Therefore, in order to get the most relevance from Budweiser's content, we applied an unprecedented level of development and distribution science. We started by digging into our unique data set to see which artists would most resonate with our audience. To do so, we looked at open record lists to see who the most relevant and timely musicians were. And the results were surprising. We then looked at Budweiser's large audience and used our patented A1 segmentation tool to divide it into a series of clusters based on interests with no overlap. A1 segmentation tool. Cool. These would help guide who would receive what content. But all the science in the world is only as good as the content that gets delivered. So we tapped Vice Media to develop a series of video content franchises that would extend the Made in America Festival gave the fans unparalleled access to the artists that mattered to them right in their news feed. Made in a Minute featured artists telling their life story and how they made it to where they are now, all done in 60 seconds. I kind of luckily just got fired at the right time. Thought it was about an hour yet. Turning Points spoke about those things and zags in everyone's journey along the way. We got a video chat from our manager. In like 10 days, you guys are going on a two-month tour in Europe. Made Me featured top artists talking about that one song that catapulted them into the public radar. A lot of people after this song came out and told me that they named their child Wolfgang and that it was in honor of me. The program culminated in a live content newsroom on the ground at the Made in America Festival in Philadelphia. And the results were pretty good. Well, maybe pretty really good. The campaign drove consideration of Budweiser among the lines and raised the relevance of Budweiser by driving a strong brand association with music. In 16 weeks, we reached 37 million people 14 times each. Budweiser is now not only the king of beers, but also on its way to becoming a king of content in our modern, feed-driven world, reconnecting with tens of millions of millennials around the globe, on their terms and in the medium of their choice. And we'll keep working on this guy. Cheers. Oh, careful. <laughs> Thanks for watching. So 37 million people 14 times, the scale of the engagement to do the things we need to do, to, to build the factories, to empty the warehouses, to get people connected to these large brands we're responsible for, is still there. The trick is using the insight and the power we have to connect with people with something that they're going to care about when they see it. And because we have these tools that we're just starting to explore, I think creatively that's a huge, huge opportunity. So we talk about Facebook, let's talk about Instagram a little bit. So. Um, I'm a huge, huge lover of Instagram. And I think it, the journey of Facebook is just starting. I think Instagram is even an earlier in development about the way in which we approach it from a brand standpoint. For the art directors in the room, the visual beauty and, and graphic quality of um, Instagram is just such a complete delight. Um, uh, uh, oh, we have technical issues. There we go. The, the, the graphic beauty is the thing that separates us. Oh, no. It's not going to work. And if you look at the images, the thing that changes, I think, when I look at Instagram versus Facebook, is that Facebook, we connect with the things and people we sort of care about first, and the content in the second. I think the amazing thing with Instagram is that people go to Instagram to celebrate the world's moments, and they look at the beauty first. So as a brand, this gives us an incredible ability to really focus on the quality and craft of what we're putting into the community, and people will give attention to it based on the beauty and craft of that story. Here's a little film that will tell you a little bit about Instagram and some of the way it works.
into your little picture of Instagram. Um, what I would recommend with Instagram, if you don't have an account, which many of you do, get one and really embrace it for your brands. I think it's huge permission to tell some different stories from different angles around how brands work. Um, scale this to the portal. Oh, we broke it. I think we broke it. Scale is really important. And one of the things that I love about Instagram is just yesterday we released um, a statistic that since it's come into the family, it's now got 200 million monthly active users. Why is that important? Well, if we go back before to what we were talking about, it's not enough just to be innovative. It's not just enough to be fun to play with. If we're going to change our connectivity to people at broad scale, we need to make sure it's reaching people who really matter. Have I been turned off presentation now? I don't know. Um, so so that, that's sort of where I'll end on Instagram. I would just to say embrace it, experiment with it, and build some really cool things. Oh, there we go, we're back up. I want to end with a film um, that's not about anything commercial. It's about something that I just love deeply. It's called Humans of New York. Are any of you familiar with Humans of New York? Have you heard of Humans of New York? Well, this is the story of Humans of New York. So, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, how can a little post on a mobile phone build a brand? How can a little post on a mobile phone tell a story of meaning and human value? I'm a filmmaker, I make art. So I want to play this film because there are many examples around the world of doing this, and maybe it's because I spent a lot of time in New York. But what this young man has done on the Facebook platform very quickly is built one of the most powerful, evocative human brands around the story of New York City I've ever seen. And I think it's really something. And it shows you that these lightweight connections, this power of craft through photography and storytelling, very quickly can create something really quite special. So this is the story of humans in New York. I moved to New York with two suitcases and a goal of taking 10,000 photos. So we think creatively of all the canvases we could have had to tell that story. He's written books now, there are books, I'm sure there'll be lots of different forms. We could have made the documentary some people, few people probably would have seen. He could have done a lot of things with a lot of different ways of telling that story. But through connecting with people in a lightweight way, with deep humanity, with beautiful craft, very quickly that's become one of the most powerful loved brands of our New York in the world. It has tens of millions of followers. 
tens of millions of people a day connect with what he's putting as a window into the soul of the city. That's the power of light hope design. That's the power of having a purpose and a mission and connecting people with things of value and doing it over time. I see that as quite an inspiration for what we want to do across the whole world when it looks at capitalism and reconnecting people with brands in a different way. Imbuing humanity into the way in which brands connect with people, and market for people, not at people, actually look at how we're serving people's needs from a fundamental level. And advertising is a manifestation of that service. If we respect people's time, if we respect our audience as much as we do our own time, and we think about what we're putting out into the world in a different way, Forget about Facebook. I just think everything we do will be celebrated more for the quality of what we're doing, not just the quantity of what we're doing. If you believe and you're sat in this room, you'll pay money to come to the number one creative festival in Spain. You believe this, that's why you're here. And I think for all the technology in the world, that really is the most important thing, is how we embrace the technology and the science to create art that does more, affects more people, and drives more business. You know, I started off with this slide where we talked about superpowers. Well, I'm not saying this just because I'm here. I'm saying this because I say it all over the world. I believe for a long time, and Bill Burnback believed this 50, 60 years ago, that creativity is the greatest power any business person has to transform their business, and it's the most under-leveraged. And now as we look around the world and we look at economies who are looking for new ideas and new ways to create new momentum, the answers are not going to come from code alone. They're not going to come just from technology. They're going to come from creative capital, creative people, designers, dreamers, and builders who understand the power of this to build something new. In Spain, I had a wonderful dinner last night with the people, as I said, that organized this. Tell me you were these people. So I think it's very important that you come together. I'm incredibly honored on behalf of everyone on Facebook to join you. Because I think the potential of what we can do, the potential of what we can build, the brands we can build, the business we can drive, is going to be better than anything we've ever seen. And the potential is really to start with people, not platforms, to market for people, not at people, and really embrace the potential of what we have in front of us. So thank you very much for having us. We really appreciate it.